Um, today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Sanaz Damiri. She's a Southern California native. Sanaz studied integrative environmental medicine at the Andrew Wheel Center for Integrative Medicine and Herbal Medicine with world-renowned Native American herbalist, Dr. Tarona Lodog. She has had a, diver a diverse career working in urgent care, neurology, mindfulness, in addition to her eight-year private practice in integrative and herbal medicine, which spawned her recent business, Sanaz Botanicals. A, a passionate advocate and speaker for evidence-based natural and traditional approaches to medicine, health, and well-being, Sanaz offers patients a holistic perspective built on strong foundation and compassionate heart. She is passionate about empowering women and children with the tools necessary to prevent illness, treat it as it's a root, and mainly healthy lifestyle choices along the way. Please help me in welcoming Sanaz. There we Hi, go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, your audio video is working. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I can't see any of you, but I'm sure you're out there in Zoom world. Um, thank you for showing up. I'm so excited to do this with Chef Jessica. It's going to be so much fun. Um, so I'm an herbalist and an integrative medicine practitioner here. This is in Samueli Center, and I'm excited to talk to you about some natural herbs that you can use to help with gastritis and help make that stomach super strong. So um, I'm going to pull up my presentation here. So three herbs for reflux, ref uh, reflux relief. Um, I actually have four in there, and that's probably explains why I'm an herbalist and not an accountant, because I, <laughs> I counted the herbs wrong. So we have four herbs, come to find out. So I'm going to um, go through them a little bit faster. So we make sure we have time for the wonderful demo that Chef Jessica has planned. So, um, oops, 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 sorry. Too excited. So all diseases begin in the gut by Hippocrates, of course, and um, things that affect our gut microbiome. I'm sure you've heard of some of these things are like C-sections, antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors, if any of you have ever been on those, um, poor oral hygiene, low fiber, a uh, high fructose diet, um, and of course, psycho psychological stressors, right? So they did this big study, the Human Microbiome Project, funded by the NIH, and they found that gut bacteria uh, produce vitamins that break down our food. And their presence of these vitamins are linked to obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, IBS, anxiety, depression, food allergies, neuroinflammation, infections in our gut, high blood pressure, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and I think, you know, anything, fill in the blank, right? So they have done studies that show that our gut microbiome is directly linked to all of these things. So a couple of facts about heartburn. Any of you have ever suffered from heartburn or have chronic heartburn? Um, 60 million American adults experience heartburn at least weekly. 15 million um, experience heartburn on a daily basis. And it's very seldom due to excess acids. acid. So a lot of the proton pump inhibitors that we use to suppress acid um, are actually, you know, especially as you age, your body releases less acid. So suppressing the little acid that you have has been shown long-term to be linked to food allergies and other things because your food isn't really digesting properly. Um, more than 103 million prescriptions for PPIs and they're now available over the counter. I have a whole different presentation just on PPI. So you don't want to get me started on that <laughs> or I will, you know, make a right and just go that way. Um, and 75% of acid reflux is manageable with lifestyle and natural approaches. So they even did a study, just one thing on PPI, and then I promise we'll get into herbs. They did a, Denmark, a study in Denmark where they took a bunch of young college kids with no reflux and put them on a proton pump inhibitor uh, for four weeks. And after four weeks, when they weaned them off, um, they had rebound reflux. So it's hard to get off of them long-term when you've been on them. Okay, now we're gonna get to the fun stuff, which is herbs, which I love, love, love. Um, so how many of you recognize this plant? Some of you might have it in your garden. Um, some of you might have been poked with it and some of you are like, I don't know what that is. It's uh, aloe vera. 
So here's what the aloe vera plant looks like if you kind of open the leaf and cut it open, right? It has the outer green rink, which is the skin, and an inner uh, area that's very uh, mucilaginous. It's very like, like slimy, which is the good part. So um, the bitter yellow latex just under the epidermis is referred to as the aloe juice or the sap or the aloes. And this is more of a laxative. And what you want to get is you want to get the mucus area gel produced by the thin walled tubular cells in the inner leaf. So when you're looking for products of aloe vera, you really want it to say uh, inner fillet because you want that inner layer of the aloe. So you're not getting the laxative uh, side effect of it. Um, I love aloe vera leaf. I love it for multiple reasons, especially for the gut. So it has a profound gastroprotective activity, it helps protect the gut. It has been shown to help prevent ulcers from uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Motrin and Celebrex and that kind of stuff. And it actually lowers gastric acid secretion. So in ways it works a little bit like a PPI. And it also has antibacterial activity against a lot of the strains that cause H. pylori and stomach ulcers. Um, they've done studies uh, with uh, patients who had GERD and four week study, they gave them 10 milliliters of aloe vera gel. Um, and then they gave the other group like an omeprazole or a ranitidine, those medications that are used for gut um, acid. And they found that it was comparable, that all groups improved, but the aloe vera leaf didn't have the side effects um, that the other group had. So it is comparable. I suggest it for all my patients first line to try. Um, here is the dose. And feel free to take snapshots of the screens if you want. Um, and you can get the stuff at Sprouts. Again, I like Lily of the Valley is a really good um, brand, Lily of the Desert. And again, you look for the inner filet so you don't get the laxative, but the dose is all written there. Um, super safe, take it in the morning and at night uh, before you get meals in there and it just soothes and coats. So a lot of the herbs I recommend for the gut, I will recommend it in the liquid form because I want it to start working and soothing and healing and reducing inflammation from the minute it hits your mouth all the way down, okay? And not all of it's gonna taste great, but some of it will. <laughs> okay, so here's my next favorite herb. Um, if any of you can guess what it is, you will get a prize at the end. No, you actually won't, but you know, feel free to put up there if you think you know what it is. This is marshmallow root. It's native to Eastern Europe and North Africa. And it is a wonderful tea for upper GI issues. So whether it be gastritis, uh, whether it be a cough, um, it's, it's such a soothing herb. It helps reduce inflammation the minute it hits your mouth all the way through uh, the upper GI. And it also helps a lot of patients that have uh, coughs or upper respiratory infections or other things like that. So in Europe, uh, the German health authorities and in Canada, the Health Canada and the European Medicines Agency all recognize the use of marshmallow root for relief of mild gastric discomfort and gastric inflammation, as well as cough. Um, it's simple. I love teas. I love herbal teas. I feel like it's, you know, it's just healing in so many ways besides the medicinal property of it. Um, so this is something that you can make. And I have the recipe here and you can take a snapshot of this if you want, um, that you can make that, you know, you can leave in the refrigerator for, you know, two or three days and have it if you wanna make one infusion. Um, but I like it, the best way to do it is to not pour hot water on it because you lose a lot of that mucilage, that slimy a property that has a lot of the healing in it. So you leave it on the counter for about two to three hours, you strain it and then you can, you know, drink it right away. You can make a big old, you know, uh, picture of it and keep it in the refrigerator and have it two to three times a day as well. It works amazing. So our next herb, how many of you know what this is? So my kids use this herb as my middle name because they think I'm obsessed with it. And maybe I am, I don't know. I haven't admitted it yet, but this is chamomile. And the reason I'm obsessed with chamomile is because it has so many benefits. Um, 
I think a lot of times we underestimate herbs as gentle being ineffective, but I believe that when things are gentle, they actually have such a better way of working with the body in healing than something super duper like potent or strong. Um, there's less of a backlash from the body and it works synergistically. So uh, German chamomile, it's a very ancient herb. Um, over 1 million cups consumed globally every year, and I probably, half of that's probably in my house. <laughs> so it's used for stomach spasms. I use it for babies who have colic. Um, it's safe. Uh, studies have shown, clinical trial studies have shown that it's actually safe in babies with colic. Um, it helps with cramps, bloating, irritation, and uh, reducing anxiety. There was a study uh, done at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School um, found that German chamomile was effective for relieving anxiety and easing the symptoms of minor depression, uh, increases gastric mucus secretion, protecting the stomach, and reducing, again, stomach acid, and it reduces stress-induced hyperactivity of the intestines. I mean, I think we all have that if we're, you know, living. So it helps with so many things, anxiety, depression, colic, digestive issues, menstrual cramps. It's even been shown to help with eczema. Um, in Europe, in Germany, they use topical chamomile for eczema. And clinical trials have shown that it's comparable to low dose hydrocortisone as far as skin irritation. So it's, it's great. I even sometimes make recipes or give recipes to patients to make a chamomile bath you know, just make a big tub of tea and jump in it, <laughs> basically. And it just helps skin irritation so much. So anyways, um, and here's a simple recipe that you can take a picture with your phone. Uh, super duper simple. I love, love chamomile. I love it for kids. I love it for the elderly. I love it for myself. Um, it's just so gentle and it helps in so many ways. So super easy to make and it tastes really good. Manzanilla is the Latin word and it means uh, little apple blossoms because it tastes and smells like little apple blossoms. So how many of you all know what this is and have it in your refrigerator and haven't used it and it's almost going bad? <laughs> well, this is ginger, of course. And um, it's, I like, thinking of it as a spice that's equal to medicine, right? So ginger has been shown to help with a lot of things for our gut, nausea, indigestion, diarrhea, muscle aches and pains, congestion, colds, coughs, headaches. It's been shown to help with menstrual cramping as well. And it helps enhance circulation like with kiddos or people that have cold fingers or Raynaud's, they get blue. Ginger has been shown to help with that. Um, they've done studies of patients taking in ginger and it shows that it helps empty out the stomach faster. So a lot of our patients that have slow peristalsis or their stomach just is sluggish and the food just sits there and sits there and then they get belching and gas and just, you know, it's just like a volcano ready to erupt. Um, ginger helps and studies have shown like they've timed it. They've given patients ginger 1200 milligrams and they gave patients like a placebo and they tested gastric emptying and it's significantly faster. Um, I think it was like 2.3 minutes for placebo and 16.1 minutes after, I don't remember, but it was super duper fast. I have the numbers. Um, I can get that to you if you want. <laughs> but um, so it, it helps with all of these things. Um, it also helps a lot with helping the pancreas release lipase and aiding in fat digestion. So a lot of our, it's like a natural digestive enzyme, you know, in that aspect. So there's a lot of benefits that come from ginger. Um, and this is one of my favorite teas. There we go. Uh, traditional medicinals you can get from sprouts. I have no, you know, I don't make any money off of them or anything like that. But I know sometimes you get all this information and you want to go out and get it and you're like, okay, well, what brands? And I love traditional medicinals. This is an organic ginger. Um, here's the dose that you can kind of feel comfortable with. You know, um, if you're really looking for an anti-nausea effect, then it's really stronger if you get dried ginger. Um, or even the like little ginger candies or things like that. And pregnant women should not exceed uh, 1.5 milligrams per day of dried ginger. 
And oh my God, Chef Jessica, I think I'm gonna end on time. So this is Dr. Lodog, who is my mentor. She's an herbalist, she's an MD. Um, I'm grateful to her and I'm grateful to Dr. Andrew Weil, who I did the two year fellowship with. Um, so I owe him much gratitude. And I don't have the five, um, I, think, uh, I think you will get the five takeaways too. I summarize some of the things for you guys too. So they're simple to kind of take home and um, follow through. But that is my presentation. And I went one minute over uh, Chef Jessica. I hope that's okay. But thank you so much for listening. And thank you for showing up today. That was all really interesting stuff. And I have to say, um, here at Sci High, we have a garden outside. And we make teas all the time now. Um, so we use lemon balm, mint, and then I also have pineapple sage. And I was reading about pineapple sage also being one of the ones that can help with reflux too. So if you've never had pineapple sage, rub it between your fingers and then you can smell it and it smells amazing. So learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's some questions though. Let me see. Um, okay, I'm gonna let you kind of look through here and then I'm gonna get started. What's really interesting is that I actually don't have any ginger today. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, oh, no, no, there is. I know what I did. Okay, I will, um, okay. I need you to stop sharing first. Okay, you want me to turn off? Yep, you can turn yours off and then I can start sharing. Okay. We aren't using ginger because um, I we actually can find galangal and I don't know if the research is there for galangal, which is in the same family as ginger, but it's almost like a white ginger. So it looks like this. Let's see. Can you see that yet? No, you cannot see that yet. There you go. Perfect. So this is the long Um It is, sorry, I'm gonna move my computer through this. Okay. So it's white. And it's very woody. If you like um, Thai food, this is what they usually use. Now let's get cooking. So the first thing I'm going to actually show you is a poached shrimp salad. Okay. So we all love shrimp, um, but we overcook shrimp. And so what I'm going to try to show you is how you don't overcook shrimp. And the way that you do that is you do it with baking soda and a little bit of salt, which I've already done. So I marinated in it and then rinsed it. So I, do, I did add extra salt to all of this, but at the same time, I rinsed it out afterwards. What that does is it prevents the shrimp from being overcooked. So I'm gonna poach these shrimps in a broth. And inside the broth, I'm going to add lemongrass, okay? Lemongrass, when you buy it, it gets, it's woody, it's kind of annoying and things like that. So what you can do is you can trim it and I'm only gonna use the bottom. A lot of people only use this part. I'll do a little bit more. I do about six to eight inches like that. And then you can take a heavy bottom pot or a pan like this and then get some aggression out. And pound it. And then make sure you clean the back of your pan because it's going to get dirty and you don't want it to burn stuff. What that does is it breaks up all those fibers and then exposes all that flavor there. So I'm going to add that inside coconut milk. The other thing I'm going to add inside, lime weed or lime zest. Now they're still different in flavor. They're not the same. And I couldn't find any lime leaves. Lime leaves are a hit or miss sometimes. Um, but I use the zest and I put that inside the broth as well. I also peeled the shrimp and I'm gonna show you what the stock looks like now. That's what it looks like. Inside, I put the extra shells of the shrimp, if you have them, it makes a good broth. I've got the galangal in there and then a few pieces of garlic too. This is my poaching liquid. The way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna keep it on the stove. I'm gonna turn it on and bring it up to a boil or as high as you can. Once it comes to a boil, I want you to actually turn it off, put your shrimp in there 
and let it sit for about five minutes and then just strain it out. And then you have perfect shrimp. The fun thing about this is even if you put it in for like eight minutes, because of that baking soda that you've done, it prevents it from being overcooked. So as you can see, it's coming up to a boil. So I'm gonna turn it off now. I'm gonna put my shrimp in. Chef Jessica, can, yeah, you, go for it. can you give any advice on like to buy the shrimp? Would you recommend getting frozen and thawing mm, or are there any yeah. cost effective ways where people can get shrimp in bulk that you might recommend? Great question. So shrimp is easily found frozen. The fresh stuff is probably frozen too. The only time I buy the fresh, fresh ones are if they have the head on. And because it has the head on, it has a lot more flavor. So what I'm doing is I'm using the head and the tails and the shells to get flavor out of. And so those ones, you definitely want to make more fresh. Um, for everything else though, I say buy jumbo or large. Don't go for anything large, uh, smaller than that because they just turn rubbery. They're so hard to cook and make right. Um, so I always go for larger jumbo or larger than that and buy the frozen ones. When you, if you can, look at the package too. Pick up the package and look at the back. You can see ice crystals. If there are a lot of ice crystals, it means that the shrimp is a little bit more damaged. It's got, it's been degraded a little bit more. So what you want is clean frozen shrimp that doesn't have all that ice sitting around it. Costco too. <laughs> Seafood, anything, Costco is your best friend. So I'm gonna let that sit for a few minutes. Again, it's off already too. And while we're waiting for that, we're gonna make our um, salad dressing. And for our salad dressing, we're actually making a toasted, we're gonna keep, we're gonna make a toasted fennel dressing. So I've got, turn on my stove. And I've got a clean pan and you can toast any of your spices this way. Grab a clean pan, no oil, we're gonna dry toast this. And these are just fennel seeds. I love that you picked fennel, Chef Jessica, that's so, so good for the digestion. The, in like Indian restaurants when I was growing up, there would always be a little side of like sweet mixed with fennel and something else I feel like that was an after dinner kind of shot of things that you would take. And I remember fennel being one of them too. And this is not hard. It makes your spices last a lot longer too, doing this. So buy your spices whole. And as soon as you can smell them, you're ready to go. They're done. And you can, if you want, you can do different spices in here too at the same time. Um, Peppercorn is the one that I don't toast that much, but some people will still toast it. Let's see what else goes into the salad dressing. Salad. Date syrup. Olive oil. Date syrup, just because it's a sweetener I need. Fresh lime juice. And a hot chili, if you want. Okay. That might be a little bit too much. But if you want, you can use that. And if if you look at my proportions, I have a lot more lime juice than olive oil. I am, um, when you make salad dressings, most recipes do a three to one. So three parts oil, one part citrus or acid. I almost switch it around. It's not really, but I definitely almost make them equal because I don't find that you need that, that much um, oil in a dressing. So we're gonna take a shallot, I'm gonna cut it in half, peel it. These are French shallots. You get two different shallots here in California, French shallots and like the Chinese, Vietnamese shallots that are this big. I like these just because they're easier to deal with. You can chop them up a little bit easier. Okay. I'm gonna put that inside a food processor. And again, I use date syrup. Um, the main reason being that it, it's all natural. It's just made with dates. It's not honey, so I can give it to vegans, and it's not agave where it's a more, even more processed kind of sugar. Right. And I've got my olive oil. And I'm gonna blend everything. I know a lot of people do the, oh, let's drizzle this in. It's fine. Um, it'll come together. Just takes a little bit. Okay. Right. And then our fennel seeds. And no, we are not putting our fennel seeds full in like this. We are actually gonna grab a. 
mice grinder. Oh, and then if you want it, she'll just I'll do half of one. Grab a spice grinder. And ooh, excuse me. Oh yeah, yeah. Put the fennel seeds inside. Just like that. Put a lid on. like that and you can do it more and more some people like that bite of fennel um it just depends and fennel's in season now so if you can find any fennel go out and buy it good stuff sure. and i'm gonna put that right in jeff jessica do you think we can throw in a date if we don't have the date paste mm, instead definitely yeah start using that as a sweetener um it's really good Perfect. So then we've got this beautiful dressing. Oh my God. I wish we could smell it, Chef Jessica. I know. I, the the fennel smells amazing right now. That's why <laughs> I always I always love the smell of fennel. And I forgot the one last ingredient that's going to take this over the top. Cilantro. Oh. oh, yum. So you could do mint too, I guess. But um, there's a whole bunch of different spices and herbs that you could add in. Let's do that though. Cilantro. You can I use parsley. It. Yeah, if people don't like the taste of cilantro, just use parsley. But it makes it more green and pretty. I love it. I love that the ingredients are stuff that I have in the house. You know, I have extra dates. I have, I, you know, and yep. it's interchangeable with parsley or cilantro. It just makes it so much easier. All right. So now let's build our salad. So I've got red onions soaked in a little bit of water. It helps to just soak it in a little bit of water to take away that bitterness or that raw kind of um, mm. flavor. I've got a cucumber and I've got a spiralizer. This is just fun, everyone. You don't have to do this. You can just make a salad if you want to just make a salad. <laughs> I just like playing with tools. And so spiralizers are great because they make food look pretty. And when food is pretty, we want to eat it more. And when it's, it's veggies, yeah, I feel like with veggies too. And yes. you can make them fun. Just makes life easier. Yeah. And there's so many spiralizers that you can buy these days on Amazon, anywhere. Um, like the zucchini noodles. But I've got cucumber and I've got a little bit of carrot as well that I'm going to mix together. Chef Jessica, we have a question about the baking soda. Um, they asking if what the baking soda does to the shrimp to keep it from overcooking and how much baking soda do we put on the shrimp, just a sprinkle and how long do we let it soak before we rinse? Good question. Okay, so about a quarter teaspoon for about a pound of, oops, that's about a, a quarter teaspoon for about a pound of shrimp. And then you're only going to let it sit for 15 minutes. Any more than that, it kind of makes it, it breaks it down. So what you're doing is you're preventing Oh, why is not? Sorry about that. Oh, I see why. You're preventing the shrimp from overcooking because you're almost creating a barrier. So the moisture stays on the outside, but inside, sorry, but the outside is dry now. So it's harder for the sport to overcook just because it's hard to get to the middle now. So it's almost like you're creating a layer on the outside that's helping keep the moisture in the inside. And then oh, right. there's also a question that farm raised is okay if they can't find wild caught shrimp. What are your yes. thoughts on that? Uh, shrimp, all food to me, this is always a great question. Like, oh, what kind of chicken do you buy? What kind of fish do you buy? I'm one that feels like we just need to do things in moderation. Shrimp is a bottom feeder. Shrimp aren't, uh, shrimp can get dirty if you're not careful. And I would say just kind of, switch up your diet a little bit. And so for people who don't eat shrimp that much, that's why I wanted to introduce this. Um, but if you don't want shrimp, we, we're doing scallops next too. Um, that would be a good addition that you can do it with too. But shrimp, buy frozen. Costco is always my best friend when I say seafood, just because I know where it's coming from. Um, Santa Monica seafood is also great, but the only problem with Santa Monica seafood is that they are very, very overpriced. 
the big thing about shrimp actually is sustainability. Um, mm. The people who catch shrimp and things like that are the interesting, that's where the interest is with shrimp and farming. So I would look at um, shrimp farms where you're getting your shrimp from, but Costco usually does a good job of it. I love Costco. That's where I, I suggest know. a lot of my vitamins too. Kirkland oh, brand good. Yeah. always passes by third parties. They're clean, they have what they say is in them and they don't have mercury and lead. So Kirkland brand vitamins are also safe too. So shrimp and vitamins all in one yes. shop. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna add a little bit of the dressing on here, just like that. And then you can serve it with extra dressing if you want to, it's, it's up to you on the side, but I'm gonna arrange this so that you guys can see what it looks like. All right. Soft this a little bit. I like serving this to like a large group. Um, and if you did not see me add salt, I did not add salt because I wanted to tell you that if you wanna add salt or seasoning for this dish, you have an option. You could use fish sauce or you could use vegetarian fish sauce even. Um, you don't have to use salt. And so there's different ways of seasoning this based on what you like. So here's a big plate. I have my red leaf lettuce. It's not really pretty. You can just get red leaf lettuce and I like. So it's almost like you can make a lettuce wrap out of this. So I'm going to arrange my lettuce like that and then I'm going to put my salad right on top right there and then I'll put my shrimp on the side and chef Jessica after soaking the shrimp can you use it at a later time like look at the cook it the yes. next day or something yes okay. Yes, definitely. Just make sure you rinse it and pat it dry almost. Um, and the other thing is, you know, this broth, this, this broth that we're making, this poaching broth, I also want you to keep it and you can make soup out of it. Tom yum soup. Um, you can add, you can make so many different things from this poaching broth that you have because it's got coconut milk in it. Now, if you don't want to use coconut milk, that's completely fine. You can just use water. It won't have as much flavor but it'll still have that nice like lemongrass lime taste to it. But don't throw away that liquid, use it for something else. Wow. So there you go. There's your salad. Oh, I forgot, and some cherry tomatoes too. You can't go wrong with having cherry tomatoes. Oh my tomatoes. gosh, it's beautiful. There we go. So next dish, be really quick. Who doesn't like making pesto, right? So I'm going to show you a quick pesto. Pesto, um, a lot of people just buy because does Costco does make a great pesto. Yes, that is true. <laughs> Costco does make a great pesto. It's got a lot of oil. It's got a lot of salt in it. Um, not that there's anything wrong with those things per se, but um, let's figure out how to make our own pesto. And I'm going to show you how to make it cheaper too. So most of the time, so we're going to add garlic because, of course, there's always garlic in pesto. So I'm going to add my garlic in. And then instead of pine nuts, I'm using walnuts. Ooh. So play with this. Think of what other nuts. You know what would be really good are a toasted pecan, too. Mm -hmm. Give it a whole different flavor. This is the amount of basil I'm using. So it's about a half cup packed. Okay. Best place to buy basil. Can't beat it. Trader Joe's. Okay. Nobody sells basil like Trader Joe's does. I've tried to look for it. Nobody does. This is the best part. I'm using spinach. So oh. You can use spinach, arugula, but I'm using baby spinach that, you know, sits in your refrigerator and goes bad, getting like wilted and whatever. Quickly make a pesto out of it and then you can save it. All right. And then Parmesan cheese, hmm. if you want. You don't even have to use Parmesan cheese. You can use nutritional yeast. Um, and the best Parmesan, everyone, Costco. <laughs> I'm surprised I haven't seen you in Costco and Trader Joe's. Just I know. Just, that's where no, I live. Right. <laughs> and then, okay, and Parmesan cheese. I know everybody complains that Parmesan cheese is really expensive. 
and the Costco one is so big. Like, how are we going to do that? Uh, what are we going to do with it? Let me just say, the Costco Parmesan cheese freezes really well, too. Get so, out. Yes. Yeah, so cut it into chunks. Freeze it. And when you're ready to make a sauce or something like this, it actually grates from frozen. It's perfectly fine. So try that out. Um, it's pretty good. All right. So we're going to blend that. And this one, I do drizzle my olive oil in. Ooh. There you go. Now you will know, I'm going to show you. It's very, very thin compared to most. And so this is what I do. I don't add more oil, everyone, sorry. I add water. Huh. It's just a tiny bit, just to thin it out enough that I'm not adding that extra oil. But not that there's anything wrong with that extra oil. But I'm not adding that extra oil in to kind of um, make it too greasy. And this freezes really, really well too. And there you are. So again, you look at it and you're like, okay, I want it a little bit thinner. Then go ahead and you can add a little bit more water. Chef Jessica, can you share what brand of stainless steel pans you're using? There's a question about your pots and pans. Oh, yes. Um, the pots and pans, um, stainless and a company called Vigor, V-I-G-O-R. Really nice. Um, they're very heavy, bot they're heavy on the bottom and it's great because we need it for the induction. Um, and I just touched on it, it's really hot. Can we get them from Costco, Chef Jessica? No, you can't. What? I got these, I got these at restaurant, uh, restaurant something. Like it's a web, a web restaurant .com. Okay. But V-I-G-O-R, I think you can buy it on Amazon too. They're very nice. Like I'm, I'm very happy with them. But can I tell everyone where you go get pans? Yeah. You go to Tuesday morning. This is around the time of year where they're on sale now. All clad goes on sale around this time of year. And that means that they're coming out with new products. At places like Tuesday morning, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, they'll have an influx, like a huge amount of extra all clad pans to buy or to sell. And that's what you're just looking for. You're looking for the stainless, heavy bottom. And if you wanted a brand, you can just go to one of those places. I love it. I love it. You're hitting all my favorite stores. This is great. We're like, we're like a soul match here. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. So let's make some scallops really quickly. Why scallops? Because I think it's interesting. Um, it's one of those things that we don't eat a lot of. And so I thought, why not show you? And I didn't. In the recipe you're going to get, I want you to be uh, cautious of what you're reading. The recipe that I wrote was for big scallops expensive scallops scallops that are like 49.99 a pound maybe but the big ones and they're dry mm. they're very hard to find only restaurants really can get them but if you can get them follow the instructions um, that i've written in the recipe these are base scallops so they're the baby ones what i just want to show you that is with each scallop it's a mollusk and so it's like a clam it's the shell there's actually a foot so at the edge of it, there's a piece that actually comes off. And it's usually a little bit more white than the actual scallop itself. These guys are so small, I wouldn't do this with it either. You don't need to do it. But if you were interested, there is an extra little piece on each scallop that's called a foot. And that's what kept the scallop in its shell. Huh. So if you wanted to, you can keep, you can take them off. But that is kind of like the chewier part then. So I'm going to come over here. So what I did was I took a defrosted these, drained them, and then dried them on paper towels so that they're as dry as possible. Because when we're cooking scallops, it's quick. We want it done real, real quick. So I'm coming over here. And so the way that you're supposed to tell is you take the back end of a wooden spoon and you put it right in there and then it should sizzle. Ah. And it's not sizzling yet, but we're getting there. Okay, now we're good. So again, if you've got the large scallops, use the large ones and then place them down really quickly. You just want to hear a nice sizzle. Just like that. 
And then I'm serving this with spaghetti squash. So for those who haven't worked with spaghetti squash before, it's almost the end of the season for spaghetti squash. Like the hard winter squashes are almost out of season. I'm not gonna touch it, not gonna touch it. Because the whole idea is that we're only gonna touch it once. So we're gonna, I made a spaghetti squash to serve this on so that it's almost like pasta with pesto and scallops. And that's it. And then I'm gonna turn this off just like that. That was all it took. Now you see that stuff that's stuck on the bottom? That's all good stuff actually, that's all flavor. So if you wanted, you could take these scallops out and you could deglaze this pan or other words, otherwise clean it with a little bit of, oops, with a little bit of white wine too. So you could take some white wine to this and it'll deglaze the whole pan. Or you can pretend that this is white wine and that's it. And then you could scrape it and then make another sauce out of it too. So I am going to show you the spaghetti squash. And then you are done. So here is spaghetti squash that I roasted. Ooh, that's pretty. I'm gonna flip it over. For those who have never seen this before, it's so fun. This is where food is just fun, 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 fun. So you're gonna go in and you can make spaghetti squash out of it. I love how easy that is. Chef Jessica, yeah. we have a question about vegetarian scallops and if those Ooh. can be used instead. Do you of have course. thoughts on that? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I grew up in Taiwan, so I'm very familiar with all the different kinds of uh, vegetarian or vegan uh, seafood out there. Yeah, you can use that. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> and you, can, you know what would be good is just even tofu. You could even do like a little bit of tofu with it. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna just serve this. I'm gonna put a little spaghetti squash on the bottom. Put a little bit of the pesto right on top. Because it'll oh mix gosh. in just like that. And then we'll put a little bit of the scallop around the outside. Ooh. Just like that. And then we've got a little bit of spaghetti squash with your scallops ready to go. That's beautiful. Cool. Any other questions, anyone? Are you going to taste it, Chef Jessica, or do I, I need will. to come down there and do no, it? No, yeah, you need to come down and taste it. You will definitely <laughs> okay. need to come down. Okay. So we'll finish it up. That. Yes. <laughs> Thank you guys, everyone, for joining in again. Um, we have our next event next month on the 17th with Dr. Ryan McNally, and he's going to be talking about longevity. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chef Jessica. I'm, I'm salivating. Yay. <laughs> and it's so beautiful. And the colors are so pretty. And you made it so simple. Like I, you know, I think the best, I think food can be intimidating sometimes cooking healthy and you made it so simple and so doable. So that's awesome. Um, there's some questions I was going to see if we can get to. Please, um, go for it. I tried to ask all the cooking ones while you were presenting. Let's see. My husband gets really bad bloating in the middle of the night, usually around 2 to 3 a.m. Is this part of the same realm of reflex issues to be approached the same way? Absolutely. I mean, I think anybody with bloating or belching or reflux, um, try the teas. Try the, I would start with the aloe for that. That helps a lot with indigestion. Um, where can you buy the marshmallow roots? So I like ordering the herbs um, either through Mountain Rose or if you want to do through Amazon, just make sure it's organic. Um, they do sell marshmallow root tea bags, uh, but I haven't seen them at the local like Sprouts or Trader Joe's. You have to get them off Amazon too. So you might want to start with the tea bags and when you absolutely fall in love with them, buy uh, the bulk herb and you can use it. Just put in a sealed glass container. Um, I might have missed it, but is it specific German chamomile? I usually just see chamomile. Yes, there's different types of chamomile. A lot of the studies have been done on German chamomile, but both are good to use. So um, Trader Joe's has a really good inexpensive chamomile tea bags. I always get them raw just because I go through them so much. So I get loose leaf and just, you know, um, make loose leaf teas 
uh, myself. Um, is ginger tea better or how about ginger pill? I think both are really good. Again, the pill is dried, so it's really good for like nausea type stuff. Um, fresh ginger is really good for colds and has a really anti-inflammatory effects too. So both have uh, benefits. Um, any book recommendations to learn more? Oh my gosh, there are lots of good book recommendations. I like, personally, I'm biased to Dr. Lodog. So Dr. Lodog has a really good, um, has a couple books out there. Just look her up on Amazon on herbs and also kind of natural things you can do at home. Um, to keep yourself healthy. Um, but um, I'm hoping we'll start doing some herbal seminars too. So hopefully UCI, you can come back here and we can get that. Um, thank you very much. Could you advise on how to consume the four herbs you mentioned? Um, like can they be taken all at once or is it better to space them out during the day? I like starting one thing at a time spacing it out, give it a week, and then start another thing. That's just how I like starting everything to see how it works. And I think there was a follow-up question about Pepsid. Um, H2 blockers, which is Pepsid, is a little bit better than PPIs like omeprazole um, because PPIs long-term have been shown to decrease magnesium, cause food allergies, put you at risk for osteoporosis, osteopenia, more at risk for pneumonia. Um, H2 blockers like Pepsid have a lower risk of that. But again, if you're using these things on a long-term basis, then the root cause isn't being addressed. And that's where I use a lot of herbs and stuff to get to the root cause. So Naz, are there any herbs that help with inflammatory bowel disease? Yes, yes, yes. So I love slippery elm. It's kind of like marshmallow root. You make a slippery elm gruel, it's an herb. You get the powder, you mix it with hot water, you mix a little maple syrup or honey. It works so good for inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease, really, really good. And some other things like turmeric and stuff that um, we can talk about later. Um, uh, Chef Jessica, there's a question if you put any seasoning on the scallops. Yes, and so um, you know how I was, I had them on the paper towels. I seasoned them and then I put the paper towels on them because the paper towels will draw out some of that extra moisture for you. So yeah, season it but then put them on the paper towel so that um, they kind of drain out and get nice and dry. And how did you roast the squash? Ah, I just flipped it over 400 degree oven for about, this is where it's gonna range. Depending on the size of your squash, it can be anywhere from 40 minutes to 60 minutes. Okay. Um, what is the difference between ginger and turmeric? Ooh, there's, um, there's lots of good <laughs> differences. They're both roots, which is what they have similar in. They're both pretty anti-inflammatory. Um, turmeric is a lot more potent anti-inflammatory for joints and for um, inflammatory bowel disease too, and for other things. Um, and ginger helps with inflammation, but on a different scale and also helps more for digestive issues uh, that go along with that. Chinese medicine considers chamomile as a cooling herb. Does the German chamomile suit people who feel cold midst of time? Um, I think so. And I think if you want to feel more warm, make some ginger in there because ginger is definitely a warming, more of a warming herb. Um, German uh, chamomile essential oil can be used as well. I am picky about ingesting essential oils. I, I don't recommend it because they are so much more potent than the herb themselves. So topical or in, in diffusers is okay with me. Is there Trader Joe's chamomile tea German chamomile? I think it is. I do believe it is. Um, oh gosh, I just rushed through all those questions. Okay, I did it. I think that's it. Did we, do the herb teas have any caffeine? The ones that I talked about do not have any caffeine. So all the herbs we talked about are caffeine free. So you can take them if you're sensitive to caffeine. Is that it? Is the Trader Joe's tea camel, uh, German chamomile? Yes, I believe it is. I think I answered that one too. Oh, we got through it. We did we it did. and it's 12.56. Woohoo! Yay. Good job. <laughs> Yay. Thank you everyone again for attending. We'll be having, we'll post this up um, and come see us next, next month with Dr. Ryan McNally. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye everybody. <laughs>